All right, it looks like we have people filtering in. I'm, I'm hoping you guys can hear me. People nod if they can hear me. Yes, okay. Um, we're gonna wait for just a few more minutes. We've got almost 50 people coming on and I'm going to <clears throat> share my screen. Um, I'm share my screen here. Lindsay's texting me, we can hear you. Great. Oh, I got my zoom up there. My where is the there we go. All right, can you guys see that too? Okay, I think we maybe just have a few more minutes. Two. We'll get started at five oh five. For those of you who are joining just now, we'll be starting promptly at 5.05. .05, so we're just letting a couple more people come <clears throat> online. All right, I think we can probably get started. So I wanted to thank everyone for coming. It looks like we have a really good turnout. My name is Deera Anantha-Krishnan. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons here at the Emory Department of Orthopedic Surgery. My practice focus is adult deformity surgery. Um, I focus on scoliosis. And these are really complex surgeries, and they're not only complex in terms of the surgery that's required for the patients, but they're pretty complex in terms of the patient's journey, even to get to me, um, having the patients go through surgery and caring for them afterwards and getting them to recover from surgery. All of these things are, are really complicated. So in the interest of trying to <clears throat> educate patients, other providers, people caring for patients. Um, we are going to hear some stories today from six of my patients. These are surgical patients and um, 
although they all have scoliosis, they all have um, their own their own stories that are unique to each of them. And um, it's been my pleasure to get to know them and to and to help them through this journey. So um, we're really happy to have all of you here. We have a, a really good group of um, family members, other patients, providers. We have some people from our women's multidisciplinary clinic, and um, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to pass this off to um, the facilitator, who is Nancy Depraskas. She, this is really um, her baby. She's bird dog this, and um, yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, Nancy. I'm going to stop sharing so people can see you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ananta Kristen. I am so excited to be here again. I want to welcome everybody that's here this evening. My name is Nancy Vapraskas, as you just heard, and I'm serving as the facilitator for this evening. I'm very, very excited to be here with this group of people. And it's true, I've been jogging this because we all want to share this story. The purpose of this town hall is to talk to you, share the stories of those of us who are on tonight. Six adult deformity and scoliosis patients. We're all different in how we presented in the surgery we had, and yet we're all the same. We're gonna share with you this evening our journey, our recovery, uh, our encouragement to others of you who are listening who may see the surgery the same way that we did. It was a hard decision to have the surgery. Is it a challenging recovery? Hell yes, it's a challenging <laughs> recovery. Uh, but you end up with a life renewed and re-energized. We would all say absolutely. So what we want to do tonight, our goal tonight, is to encourage other people to get informed uh, we want them to weigh their options. And then if you're like us, good candidates for surgery, we hope you're going to leave tonight thinking about saying a very loud yes to preparing, to pension, to being patient in your recovery process, doing what you're told, but then reaping the rewards of waking up every day grateful to have your back. So for us, this is an evening of possibilities and celebrations. Now, most of you who are on the call, thanks to COVID-19, are very experienced in Zoom use, so I won't bother to go into a lot of details with that. We do plan to keep to our 90 minutes. We want to share our story, and we want to have time for Dr. Ananta Kristen to share her perspective as well, along with Sarah and Maggie, two great scoliosis physical therapists, therapists who are here at Emory. And we want to have time for questions. So if you will please provide your questions via the chat icon that's down at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to everyone, then we'll provide an email to which questions can be forwarded. We know that, uh, as was just said, that we have patients on here tonight. We have potential patients. We have doctors, support teams, and families. And so each one of you brings a unique perspective to this surgery and recovery, and you probably have different questions. So with that, let's get started. I'll go first of the six. Again, my name is Nancy Vapraskas. I am 70 years old. I am a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and an owner of a leadership performance company. I was first diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 14. So that would have been 1964, a really long time ago. My parents didn't like the surgery option, which was a year in a body cast. And so the decision was made that what I needed to do was just get on with life and live with it. And so that's what I did. My life was certainly good. I've had a great and rich life, but every grown woman with scoliosis remembers the tears you shed as you were putting clothes on and they didn't fit right. And well-meaning people kept telling you to stand up straight when frankly, you couldn't. But life moved on and I suppose I lived with pain most of my adult years, but that's really not the part I remember. Early on, I had a doctor tell me that one day I simply wouldn't be able to walk anymore. It was told to me like it was a fact, not something that could be changed or something I could do anything about. 
Now, I was vehement that I was going to live my life fully. He wasn't going to tell me I was going to be a person who wouldn't walk. But I have to say his words certainly stuck in my head. I was at the beginning, once he talked to me, of taking on the job of pushing the rock up the hill. And although I periodically saw non-surgical orthopedists and certainly saw a lot of doctors in the course of my life, never was there a discussion of reconstructive surgery. I think you'll find that's different for several of the other people on the call. I was just told how best I could manage it. People reminded me how strong I was and that just edged up my pride in being a person who could overcome all of this. After all, I don't think I thought I had much of a choice. Um, I had a team, I still have a team. Thank goodness I still have that team that kept me going. And I just went on until I couldn't go on anymore. As a matter of fact, as Dr. Anatha Krishna knows, I met her because, or came to see her as a patient because I was going to a physical therapist and she wanted to get a baseline. And she sent me to an ortho over at Wellstar who I think took about 10 minutes looking at my x-ray and walked into the room and said, um, you need to go back to Emory. You need to get in their system. There's a doctor, Dr. A, that's good to see. You need to have surgery. As a matter of fact, you need to have surgery like yesterday. <laughs> so of course I thought she was wrong, but I entered into the Emory system and I do think that if you haven't been followed for a long time and you're entering into the Emory infrastructure, it's really daunting. That's why I'm so glad that I'm hearing that there's going to be an interdisciplinary team because getting prepared for the surgery is an absolute process. And I was a novice in terms of figuring out who I should see and how I would get in to see them and what kind of questions um, I should ask. And I will say for me as well, one of the big issues at my age was I ran into a lot of doctors who just basically told me I'd lived with my scoliosis this long, I ought to just keep living with it. Um, the problem was I wasn't living much anymore. I had started to be in situations where catching my breath was really hard if I did any sort of exercise. I taught a class at uh, Georgia State where I sat down almost the entire uh, school season. My husband drove me in and picked me up and brought me home. Um, I could barely walk a block and uh, even short trips from the car to a restaurant required somebody taking my hand to make sure that I could keep my balance. I love hospitality and entertaining and that just became absolutely grueling for me. And it was sad for me to watch my family just kind of gather around me to kind of keep my reputation intact. But my life just kept getting smaller and smaller. And honestly, I just hated it. Um, but I was scared too and wondering with all these people telling me maybe I was not, um, maybe I was too old to do it. Um, but then I clearly remember one day when I just thought, I'm having this surgery, you know, that's just it. And, um, and so in June of last year, um, about a year after I met Dr. A for the first time, I went in for surgery, two days, 16 hours, but you know who's counting, uh, and came out fused from my sacrum to T7. I still have a significant curve. I think Dr. A will talk a little bit about that. It turns out that much of my back was already fused, but it is such a huge improvement. It's certainly a big deal that my breathing has improved. I have better digestion. I walk on my own. I don't have to be accompanied. And of course, having the hump on my back go away and dropping two shirt sizes was um, a really pleasant after effect I wasn't necessarily sure I would have. The surgery is hard. The ICU experience is really hard. ICU nurses are amazing. I created a prayer and support team for whom I'll be grateful for all my days getting through this. My family was amazing. 
I will tell as part of my story that I originally told my family not to come to the hospital. It wasn't that I was afraid of the surgery. Honestly, the only thing that worried me by the time we got to the actual surgery date was waking up with a breathing tube, um, which didn't happen by the time I woke up, it had been taken out. Uh, but I was afraid that on drugs, I wouldn't be able to handle me well. And I had lived a life of just taking control of my own circumstance. And who wants their kids to see them when they're totally out of control, right? But the lesson I had as I came out of this is when you're in recovery from this kind of surgery, you're actually not in charge of anything. Recovery has a mind of its own, your body has a mind of its own, and you just, you just have to give in and do what it's telling you it wants you to do. You can't overpower it. The last thing I'll share is, I think one of the oddest experiences for me on the emotional side was the day Dr. A told me I could drive. We left the doctor's office. My husband was all set for us to go out and celebrate. And I, I just said, I, I just wanna go home. And I just went home and cried because I think it was the first realization that my day of pushing the rock up the hill, the day of overcoming was coming to an end. And so, and you know, Dr. A, I say this to you every time I see you, I am grateful every day. So thank you. And now I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so these are, I'm gonna show just some brief x-rays from each patient. We'll hear from Sarah Height, who's one of our Emory scoliosis therapists who's helping Nancy now. Um, so these were uh, Nancy's x-rays when she came in. She had a, you can, this, the x-ray on the left is looking at her from the back and the one on the right is looking at her from the side. And she had a really significant curve. It's a, almost an 80, I'm sorry, 80, 80 degree scoliosis over here and then a compensatory curve above this. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that these x-rays actually don't look as bad as she did when she came into my office. Now, a lot of patients will, you know, she mentioned the dress size, a lot of patients will wear really big flowy clothes, kind of hide the fact that they have this, what's called a deformity. Um, and she was really doing that. And I remember thinking, how is this woman walking around so capable, con you know, used to controlling everything? I just felt terrible that you had suffered for so long. Um, the other thing that I think, and, and I think probably the reason that you really came to see me was a lot of it was basically at the bottom of where your scoliosis was, as she has mentioned, she was completely fused all through here and then everything below it just kind of broken down, like the bottom of the leaning tower of Pisa just broken down and she had a lot of pressure on the nerves in that area, which I think was part of what her problem was. And you can kind of see this is her CAT scan over here on the right side. These, this is that hump that's totally fused through here. Um, this was her MRI and you can see these are her kidneys. Her lungs are actually kind of getting squashed down. The area where her um, stenosis was really bad was right here. And um, she had really the trifecta of problems. Um, it was pretty complex. I actually talked to a couple of my partners about what to do and whether we should try to, you know, trying to correct this big hump um, is, a really, really, very, very dangerous surgery, um, but and and my feeling was that she didn't she didn't really need that. Um, we did. I was a little concerned about her bone density, so I think she mentioned a little bit that um, you know the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach of trying to get other people in to help with bone density, with breathing exercises, pre-op therapy, what we call prehab, to try to get people ready for the surgery. These are things that we're trying to take a little bit more of a global approach on to get these patients ready to have a big surgery. Um, so she did have two surgeries. Um, this was actually, I think in between or just before the second surgery where we actually put two spacers in at those broken down levels and then ended up um, flipping her over uh, or you know, going from the back the next day. And this is what she looks like now. So to her point, um, you know, she, her curve, I, I elected not to try to do anything to that area that was already locked in um, we just did most of her correction below and above that. And her curve now measures in the 60s, which is, I went back through your records, Nancy, with what you, your curve was, I probably think of 15 years ago, it was in the 60s, because I measured some of your old films. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, she looks, you know, it's really too bad we couldn't do this in person because you could, you know, see how really amazing she looks and she's got some residual weakness. I was uh, in her leg and she's working with Sarah. Sarah, I don't know if you want to chime in here and see make a, any comments about Nancy's um, progression. Yeah, absolutely. So, hi, I'm Sarah Height. I'm a Schroth certified scoliosis specialist. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work a few floors below Dr. A. Um, I work at Emory and uh, about two years ago, I opened a scoliosis clinic. Um, so I work with majority patients with scoliosis, both pre and post-op in all ages from like 11, 12, all the way up to 100. Um, and about two months ago was when I met Nancy for the first time. Um, and we've been seeing each other for about once a week for about eight weeks. And um, when she came in, she looked great. Luckily, Dr. A did all the hard work. And so just like what Dr. A said, her main complaint was that residual weakness in her legs, not being able to walk as far as she wanted, and some trouble going up downstairs. And so um, during the in initial evaluation, um, the things that I assess are center of gravity. And if you remember on the, well, you might not have noticed, but on the x-ray, Dr. A did such a good job getting her head right over top of her pelvis, which then really helps people be more balanced when they're walking. And that's one of the first things that I assess for patients when they come in postoperatively, because depending on where they're fused on the bottom, you can still have mobility in the pelvis. And so if they're not fused and the pelvis isn't quite sitting under them, that's one of the things that we work on. But luckily with Nancy, that was not an issue. She was perfectly balanced. We also look forward and back as she balanced. And that was another thing that looked pretty good. She wasn't leaning forward anymore. Um, and so then what we were left with was she had a little reduction in the ability to stand on one leg um, and a little bit of weakness both in the hips and then in one of her ankles. And so over the past eight weeks, that's what we've really been focusing on, getting her core strong, her legs strong, helping with body mechanics. Um, and then Another component that is Schroth based, and you remember looking at her initial um, x-rays as well as her talking about just having reduced endurance, shortness of breath, things like that. And that's actually very common for patients with scoliosis at that degree. And when it gets into the, um, into the thoracic spine, it can make it difficult to breathe. And so one of the main components that I work on both pre and post operatively is helping patients learn how to breathe and helping to, it's what we call Schroth breathing. So helping to kind of promote a little bit of derotation. I mean, obviously her spine is fused, so we're not derotating the spine. We're just helping to expand some of those muscles within her rib cage that have been contracted for, you know, 60 years and helping to open them up so she can continue to breathe. Um, and so every one of her exercises have had a respiratory component, making sure she's breathing and all that. And so, I mean, at this point, our next steps are really just to continue to progress the body mechanics and gait training, really trying to um, maybe get on some uneven surfaces and going up over barriers and things like that. But overall, she's been a great patient. It's been, it's been a pleasure to work with her. All right, Connie, if you'll come off mute, which you just did, it's your turn. Hi, I'm Connie and good evening. I um, am a typical 12 year old that had scoliosis um, developed. My PE teacher kept telling me to stand up straight, stand up straight. And I was so frustrated to go home to my mom and say, she won't leave me alone. She won't leave me alone. Please help me. So it, we thought it was in my hips and I went swimming one day and my mom was there and saw my curve. So I had a, a pretty decent uh, orthopedic doctor follow me and I wore a Milwaukee brace from, he waited from the summer to the fall so I wouldn't be so hot with all the leather all around me to put me in it and then I wore it till I was 16. Um, off and on after I was 16 I would sneak and only wear it at home but at school I wasn't wearing it. Um, which probably was not a good thing but that's the way I had to live my life. I um, went on to nursing school. I got lucky that um, the hospital I went to put me into a pediatric unit initially. I love kids, but it just saved my back, I think, more than anything to be able to work a longer time without um, some injury. <coughs> Excuse me. I um, you know, follow, but in my 40s, I started having a lot of um, vertebra pain, and I went to see one of the Emory surgeons there, 
And so he followed me and had me in a 20 year study. He retired. Um, I quit going. I just started doing, I had specific exercises to do. But in 19, no, 2018, in the spring, we had been at the beach and I noticed ankle pain. I couldn't walk very well. It progressed um, for a few months. I did PT. I um, couldn't walk stairs very well. I had a lot of pain in my um, sacral area more. So it was time for me to see Dr. A again. I'd seen her two years before. Just a follow, uh, we decided I was stable, we'd just keep going. Um, and I told her I was broken, because I was broken. And um, we went through the process of MRIs and stuff to see what was going on. And I had a facet joint cyst in my L4 or 5. And Dr. A started talking about surgery, and I guess I know, and I don't think you were very happy with me because I kept saying no for a few times. But, but finally I knew I, I had to make that decision. I was very scared because um, it's, a big, it's a big surgery. And, um, and I was already scared because I knew my life had already started changing. And um, so I had the surgery in November of 2018. My curve um, shows on x-ray at and the thoracic area was like 82 before surgery. Dr. A went in and she'll tell you, I got a, back to like a 44, which I'm, um, I'm very pleased. I had the support of my family. My husband was, I'll start crying, was unbelievable in helping me. And um, someone asked just a little bit ago about bursitis in your hip. Yes, I had it for years. It's gone. I do not have bursitis in my hip anymore. Um, I, my medication in the hospital was morphine and tramadol. I went home on tramadol and Tylenol and weaned myself off because I did not want to be that person that could have an addiction. Um, we, um, we live our life now. We travel. We do things um, that weren't that I didn't feel like I was able to do as well as now I can. That's all. <laughs> well, thanks, Connie. Um, let me I'm gonna show your x-ray. So um, we're starting off with two largest curves here. So these are Connie's x-rays. And I remember thinking when she came in, um, the first time you came in, you'd been following with Dr. Horton. And the first time you came in, I just couldn't believe that you could have this deformity and, and really not have much pain. And um, you know, Connie's one of the quiet ones in the group. So I think she's just stoic and bears it really well. And you know, most, pretty much all of the patients that are on, you know, that are here today are, are essentially the same. They put up with a lot of day-to-day -day pain. And by the time they get to me, it's, it was really incredible to me that actually the thing that really caused her to have, have a problem was was, I'm oh, sorry, it was once again, it was once again at the bottom of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So she ended up having this uh, facet cyst, which I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, so this, basically this is at the very bottom of that deformity. So um, kind of what, to Sarah's point, you know, the body has to try to keep holding your head over your pelvis. And so you can see her chest is kind of shifting over here towards the right. And then these levels over here get really broken down. And she ended up getting a degenerate, really bad degeneration here. And there's, you can see there's like this little balloon of a cyst, um, similar to the cyst people get, cyst people get on their knees with arthritis. And that was pushing on her nerves. And actually by the time we went to surgery, um, I, I'm pretty sure your leg pain was kind of gone, the leg symptoms that you had. Um, the, the mistake would be to, to just, you know, go in and try to open this up without addressing the whole deformity. Um, obviously if somebody's in their eighties and can't tolerate a really big surgery, then, you know, that seems reasonable. But for somebody like Connie, who's, you know, otherwise healthy, um, really on almost no medication, wants to live her life. And, and what Ms. Vipraska said earlier, you know, life's just getting smaller and smaller. Um, we ended up doing a pretty big surgery on her. This is her, um, I think you had a T4 to the ilium fusion. And um, 
yeah, somebody have somebody leave the hospital with just tramadol is pretty impressive after this type of operation. Um, but I think it just goes to goes to show how much um, day to day pain these patients have. Um, she's done remarkably well, and yeah, really an, an inspiration. And um, yeah, very smooth. I have to say, <laughs> I think I probably spent more time preparing for your case than I've spent even even talking to you post op up until now. So um, yeah, I think it's a it's a good testament to the stoic nature of a patient. So, Ken, it's your turn. Remember to come off mute. There yeah, go. I'm on mute. Yeah. Okay. Hey, good evening. I'm, I'm Ken Shaw. I'm 62 years old. I'm an anesthesiologist. And my story is a little bit different from everyone else's because I had a normal spine until about 25 years ago when I had a pretty severe back injury from what I call a weekend of extreme yard work, which entailed pulling vines from trees for about three days. So for about the, the 20 years after the injury, I had off and on, um, it was a, a right low back, right hip and right leg pain that would, you know, it would bother me here and there. Um, occasionally would limit my activity where, you know, if I was doing a lot of walking, I had to stop and squat because my hip would start hurting so bad where I just, you know, I couldn't keep going. And, you know, I, I plugged along all those years with my back and about a year prior to my surgery, was, which was in 2016, so this is about 2015, the pain changed. It became, um, it worsened. It was all of my right hip for the most part and right leg. I started developing a right leg weakness and even a foot drop. Um, the pain was so bad where my last nine months before I had surgery, I basically slept on an Ikea mat on the floor in my home. I work full time still as an anesthesiologist, so I wore um, to work, I call it a weight belt, it's like a compression belt you could cinch, and that would kind of help me get through the day. <clears throat> Finally, in March of 2016, I had the good fortune of uh, meeting Dr. A. And I remember going in to see her the first time, and it was a very emotional uh, meeting for me because I now realized I had met somebody that could actually take care of me. Um, we discussed all my back issues, the surgical plan. I remember when Dr. A brought out the, 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 the sheets of what she wanted to do, and it was going to be a two-stage surgery. Um, I think she said it would take six hours for one part and 12 for the next. <clears throat> we went over the post-op, um, you know, the recovery, the post-op. And I, I really, uh, I'll never forget, Jennifer Hudson was her nurse at the time, and I think still is. And Jennifer said, basically, Ken, you'll be married to us for the next year. So, um, and that's pretty much how it is. Um, I was able to get work in early. So my surgery was going to be um, about oh, seven weeks later from our meeting. And um, by the time my surgery date came around, I was so ready. I, I, I was excited, actually. And Dr. A gave me the name of two of her previous patients who were, were male, about my age, and similar kind of surgery. So I called both of them and talked to them. And they were most helpful. And they answered a lot of the things you just never think about. So, I mean, I had everything ready. Uh, I remember uh, walking in the door of the, uh, the ortho spine hospital. It was April 29th, and um, I had my first surgery, which was uh, L4-5, L5-S1 A-lift, which is an lumbar inner body fusion. And that was where they did the anterior approach. And it took less than six hours. And I remember waking up from that, and I was totally pain-free. The hip pain I'd been experiencing so badly for the last few years was totally gone and it's never returned. I also had uh, regained two inches of my height. I'm six five. Um, I think I dropped down to about six foot two and I'm pretty much back to six five. Um, the second part of the surgery, which was four days later, it would be May 3rd, 2016. Uh, we did a, uh, Dr. A did a T8 to the ileum infusion. And I was told in 12 hours, you'll be in ICU, you'll be intubated probably. It was less than 12 hours, and I was waking up, and I was not intubated, and I was in the ICU just the one night. Um, I was glad because I just, I don't know, I just, uh, I wanted to be back in the regular room. Um, I was discharged on post-op day number nine. I have been basically painful since then. About the only thing I ever experienced, what I call like a back tightness or it's like a spasm I get in my back. It's nothing that, you know, it's, it's not anything bad. It's just part of it. Um, I stay very active. Um, I do um, like a TRX, which Dr. A said I could do. I do 
uh, what I call senior yoga, which is not the extreme, it's the basic yoga, what you hold poses for. And I do meditate, I, you know, I've gotten a lot more in tune to who, who I am as a person. And the biggest takeaway from this is um, what I thought was going to be a really crappy life four and a half years ago. It's like I got my life all back given to me on a silver platter. And I think of Dr. A every single day, and I'm so grateful for this person because she basically saved my life. Mm -hmm. And I know she hates me when I say that, but it is so true. And everybody that knows me, they know how much I love that person because she's just wonderful. Um, okay, Dr. A, can you top that? I, you guys are turning this into like a, yeah, a Dr. A fest, which I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really want. That's not the purpose of this, but, um, and, no. and yeah, it wasn't a, it was not a silver platter. You're supposed to be painting a realistic picture for people. We're not <laughs> no, it, yeah. For me, it was. Scoliosis surgery is out of silver platter. So, um, so yeah, my, I, you know, what's really interesting to me, and we talked about this in our prep for this, is that, you know, all six of these patients, and it's been some time, as you guys can see, that we've operated on them, I've operated on them. And it's, it's to be honest, it's a we. Um, Ken mentioned Jennifer Hudson. Um, we have our therapist, Sarah and Maggie, my admin, um, our PAs. Um, there's, it's a huge team. It's, it's really not just me, but the thing that struck me about Ken with Dr. Shaw was that, you know, he's an anesthesiologist and once again, he was just so deformed. You can see here on the right side, um, he's really leaning forward. He's got the C-shaped curve. He could not stand upright. And a lot of the reason he could not stand upright, and again, I think the thing that really pushed him kind of over the edge was he had in this region, and this is what's called a degenerative scoliosis. So as he mentioned, he didn't have a scoliosis from um, adolescence. Um, hit right in the, in the region where the curve, this very short acute curve is the most severe, he had a huge amount of compression on the nerves. The, the deformity was also pretty rigid. And so that's why we, we went in from the, from the front first and we put these, um, you can see this was a fluoroscopy shot from the first day where we put these spacers in to try to give him some of that, his natural curve back. Um, and then that, uh, and just to your, to your point, Ken, I know, I know you're an anesthesiologist and you plan exactly out how much anesthesia you need for each surgery, but you know, you don't want to land the plane with no gas, right? So <laughs> you usually overshoot on the amount of time and tell you, <laughs> tell you that we're going to need. So, um, yeah, so this is what he looks like now. Um, and you know, obviously this is a pretty rigid area. So to his point about, you know, you lose, you lose a significant amount of flexibility. So there's always a trade-off, obviously, with anything in life, and particularly with surgery, right? You're always going to be trading. In this case, you trade some flexibility and motion for, for decreased pain and improved function. So a lot of patients will ask me, you know, can I touch my toes? The majority of the time, the answer is yes. Um, you'll lose maybe some rotation. Um, inside to side bending, but overall people's function um, for this type of problem is significantly better. Um, so, and yeah, he was a, a, a pleasure to take care of. Everyone, all these patients have been a pleasure to take care of, but you're painting a way too smooth of a picture. I do think we have some people who've had some problems that are coming up, so they can, <laughs> they can <laughs> you don't need to turn anything here. All right, who's next, Nancy? Steve. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm Steve Henley, and I'm a 68-year-old retired industrial maintenance professional. At least I like to think I was. And uh, I've been suff suffering with back pain for probably 25, 30 years, and it's grad it gradually and gradually got worse. My primary care physician, uh, he dealt with me for a few years and he finally said, oh, I'm going to send you to the Emory Clinic. And he called, made an appointment for me. I went and saw one of the doctors at the Emory Clinic who uh, prescribed a epidural injection into my, into my spine. And uh, as a result, it helped enough that he said he didn't think surgery would be necessary and that uh, as a result he would turn me over to the Emory Pain Clinic. So 
I was at another pain clinic for years. Uh, as things progressed, I went from, uh, I went and had a spinal cord stimulator installed to uh, simply mask the pain that I was having down my right leg. And after that, after having the uh, spinal cord stimulator installed, uh, it working and I had it adjusted three or four times before we finally ended up taking that out completely. Uh, in the meantime, I had had a laminectomy done, which clear, cleared up a lot of problems that uh, on the right side. But as a result of that, all the pain moved to the left side of my body and from my hip all the way down to my toes. And uh, kind of like Ken, it just developed to the point that uh, I was I was missing steps. I'd have to stop and, and get my bearings again, so to speak. But uh, then also on top of all of that, uh, back in 20, I mean, 2003, I had gas bypass surgery. And as a result of the gastric bypass surgery, not being able to take in some of the uh, nutrients that it needed to be and how well they were handled by the body, it, uh, it created a lot of problems preparing for this surgery. But I had never heard my wife had suffered with scoliosis when she was younger and been in a body cast, but no one had ever mentioned scoliosis to me until about 10 years ago. And it was after the laminectomy surgery. And uh, Dr. Gerald Roke said, Emory, he mentioned to me one day, has anybody ever said anything to you about scoliosis? And my answer was no, I'd never, no one had ever mentioned that. And uh, so it wasn't long after, well, probably in, 2014, I was introduced, well, yeah, no, 2017, I was introduced to Dr. A, uh, and first thing she said at that time, I was down to 180 pounds, and she said, you need to gain 20 pounds before we do this surgery, and I had all the tests required to do it by my, uh, all my uh, providers that were looking after me at that time so it was uh it was kind of life changing and and getting ready mentally for the surgery and through a lot of a lot of prayers and uh, a lot of consulting with my wife and my son it was uh and i can't mention how great they were to me while i was recovering from this surgery but the morning of the surgery, I was in such a piece that I don't remember half the time. I don't even remember going into the uh, operating room. So, uh, and ever since then, it's all been uphill. Uh, I no longer, my of course, I mentioned earlier to the group that uh, I had pain in my left leg prior to surgery. And now I have a little bit of uh, nerve pain in my right leg and my physical therapist Michael Dunn uh, is a dry needler and dry needling had been introduced to me about uh, 2013 and Michael kept me going for a long time uh, going to see him uh, twice a week and him performing the uh, the different dry needling techniques that uh, that he provided and those dry needling, dry needling techniques kept me going for a couple of years. And finally, I retired in 2016. The company went bankrupt that I was working for. And uh, so the pain with Ed Point was to a point that I wanted to retire anyway. Uh, I just didn't, I couldn't hold up. And if it hadn't been for my 
how long I had been working at my previous job. They probably would have fired me a long time ago, but uh, but I was still able to function, uh, having been on some very serious pain medication uh, from uh, 2003 uh, up until surgery. And within the first three months of uh, having the surgery, I was off of all painkillers that I was on. And uh, it just, it got to the point that uh, the pain was debilitating, but it was also not sleeping as much at night that, that I should. I would sleep for three or four hours and that would be it. And, uh, and it was basically all from the pain. Now I have, uh, have I sleep too much now, but uh, I'm trying to gain back what I lost during the, during the last years. But uh, Dr. A has been a, been a godsend and, uh, to me. Uh, and I just wish that I had had this surgery done 10 years ago rather than having to wait till uh, February of 2019 to have it. So that's my story. All right. Um, thanks, Steve. So, um, so these are your x-rays, your original ones from when you came to see me. You'd have the spinal cord stimulator removed. Um, your scoliosis also was a degenerative scoliosis too. So to your point about you not really knowing you had scoliosis, I actually went back and looked at some of your old films too. You didn't have scoliosis when they first put in the spinal cord stimulator. But what happened is, is that, you know, the multiple times that you've had bone taken away. Um, and, I, and I also think that some of your, some of your um, problem was a little bit related, as you mentioned, to the gastric bypass. So when you have an operation like that, you lose nutrients, as you mentioned, and your muscle strength decreases, your bone quality decreases, and that allows everything to kind of collapse down. So, you know, your scoliosis, again, kind of like Ken's, was not really that large when compared with, you know, Nancy's and Connie's, but there's a lot of really a lot of degeneration and collapse here. You can see your rib is just about here, right on top of your pelvis. Um, you've got this big hump here. You're consuming a lot of energy. This was to Sarah's point before about your body's trying to keep your head over your pelvis. So um, you've got all of these compensatory mechanisms trying to, trying to do that, um, which is very fatiguing for patients to live their lives like this. Um, the other, the, the point about me having you gain weight, and sometimes it's harder for me to get people to gain weight than lose weight, was that um, you really needed to have some extra muscle on, and pretty much everybody loses weight after the surgery. Um, so you were in a position of being, you know, dangerously thin and, and really at a risk for having infection. Um, the other issue that I was worried about with you, as you mentioned, were the chronic narcotics. So you're on narcotics for decades um, and and it's a real amazing win that you are off those narcotics now which is just incredible um, so uh, let me show you and this was your this was your cat scan um, which is you can see these big gaps this is where you had a laminectomy here and the and the um, and the uh, spinal cord stimulator has to get put in. The spinal cord stimulator was in right next to the spinal cord over here, and you basically collapse down with these bone spurs. Um, and this is, these are your x-rays. Now, I remember we were a little worried that there were a couple areas in here that weren't healing. Um, I'd considered doing um, an anterior and a posterior surgery, but I know you didn't want the anterior, so you we really did some yeoman's work about a doing your physical therapy, um, keeping as strong as possible, and then wearing that brace and really trying to limit your activities and your fusion is healed up. So I would say it's a, a win on all counts. Okay, Robin. Okay, so hi, I'm Robin. And I'm 57. I had my surgery on May 12th of 2018. And um, it feels miraculous. Um, the process of getting to where I am today was long. Uh, I was diagnosed with scoliosis when I was 11, and I wore a Milwaukee brace and then a Boston brace. I was a very slow grower, so I wore them until I was about 20. Um, and I really, I lived fully. I mean, I was very active. I gave birth to two children. Um, 
scoliosis did not really pop up in my life in a significant way until I turned 50. And then at that point, my pain increased uh, gradually until uh, I finally had the surgery. And I mean, I did so much, you know, when I got the brace at age 11, the whole notion was you don't want to have the surgery, anything you could do to avoid the surgery. And so, you know, when I started having these problems at, at age 50, you know, chiropractic, I saw Sarah, actually I did different kinds of physical therapy. Um, I ended up having an injection. I mean, ibuprofen, I mean, I had, I took so much ibuprofen for so many years. I mean, just to keep going. And I had this analogy, this frog analogy, where if you throw a frog into boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you throw a frog into cold water and you slowly turn up the heat, it'll die because it, it doesn't realize the gradual increase. You know, after the surgery, when I look back, how much I was enduring, um, I mean, if it had started off that way, I would have like gone to a surgeon, you know, right off the bat. But for me, it was just a matter of adjusting. I, I'm a lawyer. I mean, before my surgery, I had, I had to lay down at meetings um, in movie theaters. I would sometimes go into the you know, aisle to lay down. I couldn't sit for long periods of time. I was in horrible pain. And the um, orthopedist I was seeing at Emory basically said, look, your curve's not, is less than 40 degrees. If it's less than 40 degrees, we're not going to operate. So basically, you're in limbo. Like at this stage, you just kind of got to deal with it. And which, you know, so I was in my 50s. What, what did that mean? Um, and I was getting more debilitated. And then my daughter came in to my room one day because I was lying in my room when I was home like all the time. And she said, you know, mom, um, it's really hard to see you getting being so debilitated and you just need to stop being afraid of the surgery. And I was like afraid, like, you know, first of all, what are you talking about? And then I thought about it and was like, yeah, I'm really afraid of the surgery, right? I mean, you know, sort of when my orthopedist said, you know, you can't do it, it wasn't like I fought with him or argued. It was just like, okay. And then it was like, okay, this is going to change. And so I started um, looking around the country at different uh, surgeries. I was wanting to do like less invasive surgery. Then my chiropractor told me about Dr. A. And, um, and so checked her out. And it was a really big thing about meeting with, with Dr. A was I wanted to do I thought I wanted to do less invasive surgery. And Dr. A was very clear that she doesn't do that. And she, you know, doesn't work on patients after they've had that. Um, and explained to me the benefits of just sort of opening right up and kind of seeing it all there and being able to deal with it that way. And, and really in, in hindsight, I'm very glad for that. Um, so um, after the surgery, you know, the first three months are really hard. They were for me. Um, oh, and I just want to say before the surgery, you couldn't tell from looking at me, like I didn't have a hump, you know, I kind of was centered pretty well. So people really couldn't tell. Um, after the surgery, I remember um, when I had my staples out, it was the first time I actually looked at my scar and I freaked out because it's this long scar. And I was like, oh my God, what, like what am I, this stuff is in my body. And it was just so kind of overwhelming. Um, but, you know, did stuff to kind of keep my mood up, sitting out in the sun. Um, you can't do much the first few months. You got to kind of stay pretty still. And, um, but, you know, a year later, like a year after my surgery, my son and I, um, I took him to Iceland. He graduated from college and, you know, we took a full trip and um, did lots of walking. And um, right now, I mean, I walk a few miles every day and I feel like I have my life back. And that's just it's a miracle. I mean, it's something I just feel so blessed about every single day. I'm aware of it every day. Um, I had amazing support from my spouse. Um, my mom was incredibly supportive. I know she's on this call. Um, and uh, Maggie is my physical therapist and has been amazing in helping me just strengthen so that I can do what I want to do. I don't want to have limitations. Um, I can't do somersaults. I've gotten over that. But otherwise, I can do pretty much what I want to do. And, and that's it. Oh, wait, I want to say one other thing. Sorry. So I was home and it was like, what do I want to do with the rest of my career? Um, you know, after the surgery, you've got a lot of downtime and I'm a lawyer and I just that, um, 
given that I had the surgery, which at first, you know, if that was a question to begin with, because it's so big, I thought, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my time? And I decided I, I left my job so that I could focus full time on um, criminal justice reform and other human rights work, and and um, which feels great. So, I mean, that that change wouldn't have happened had it not been for the surgery, and that's a really positive thing in my life. Okay, now I'm done. Thanks, Robin. Dr. A. So, um, so these are Robin's films, um, and I think we'll we can bring in maybe both Sarah and Maggie to talk a little bit because I think we have some time. Um, and she, I think you touched on a, a lot of um, really good points. Um, the first one is that, yeah. So your curve, you know, I, I remeasured all your curves today, and um, you actually have, you know, these. They're they're relatively mild, right? You guys have already seen the you know Connie and Nancy's curves, and you know this curve. So you're, I would say that I don't know what your curves were when you were braced, but the braces probably did a good job of holding your curve at a particular level. And so the magic number forty between forty and fifty degrees, if it's over that, we think it's going to progress. Um, that's kind of what we tell people when they're younger. But one of the things that um, you guys, the patients, have taught me is that you know, what's in the book is not always what it is in person. And so um, for Robin, you know, you have this curve, I think the main curve measured maybe 34 degrees. You have a little bit of a curve up here going up into the thoracic spine. And you actually have sort of almost like a, a curve going right up into your cervical spine too. And I know we've talked about that. You didn't really comment on that, you know, that bothering you necessarily. But you can see the sort of diffuse nature of this curve. And I, I think I remember like we were trying to find like one level that was the problem. So the point about like, I don't do minimally invasive surgery. Well, I, I mean, if it's indicated, I'll do it. But in this type of thing, it's a little bit like spitting in the ocean, right? So um, we couldn't really see that there was one area that is, the, is really the primary pain generator. Um, you had, you know, degeneration all through this region. Um, you know, this area is very flexible. So what that means is when you're standing up, your things are getting compressed down. Um, there, you had a lot of arthritis there. And really, for someone in your age group, the ideal thing is to really address the whole deformity. It becomes very difficult. My, my point about go somewhere else and get one level done, then it becomes a little like locking in that bottom of the lean, lean tower of Pisa. And then I'm trying the rest of the time to move things over after things are already locked in down here. So um, that I think is a very, it's a, it's a good lesson. Like you, you, you know, you guys are all for, for, um, and, and I'm sure everyone in the panel who's, who's listening can hear how, how driven all of you are and how you are used to pushing through pain and you're used to really controlling situations. And it's, um, it's a good personal development journey to go through a big surgery like this. Um, and I think that, it's a, you know, it's a, a good learning experience um, for me as well, because I've learned a lot from all of you patients. I know that um, Jennifer, Amanda, my PA, my old PA, Dale Ziegler, even my admin, Tanisha, I think all of these guys are on the call and they'll tell you they've, they've learned stuff. We, we all learn from each other. So um, we elected to, um, and I think it was a we, it was a joint decision to fuse you right up into, your, into this upper curve and leave this this way upper cervical thoracic one alone because it didn't seem like it was giving you any problems. So we've been following that. And I know you, um, you know, you worked with Sarah pre-op and you're working with Maggie now um, and maybe both of them can speak a little bit to your uh, case, but I think overall you're doing, you're doing great and we're, we'll keep following this curve and hopefully you won't need anything else. Maggie, would you like to add some things? Maggie's here, we'll go with Maggie. Sure, I'm happy to. So I worked with Robin post-operatively and um, her rehab after surgery was actually, go. it went really smoothly, mostly because she'd had some really great PT by some really great therapists beforehand. Um, so we were able to build on that. Um, she already knew the concept of a lot of the breathing that I'm sure Sarah introduced to her. Um, she had great core stabilization from all of her work with a colleague of mine at another practice in Atlanta. So we just capitalized on that. She didn't have a ton of mobility issues. Um, it was more about improving strength, um, core strength. And really, I would say that part of her rehab went really, really fast. 
um, and has now really focused on trying to preventatively manage that cervical thoracic curve that Dr. A was mentioning now. Um, and I will say, I know a lot of these patients have kind of sugarcoated over it, but it's a lot of hard work. Their rehab is not easy. And I think they're so grateful for feeling so much better that they don't realize how hard they're working in therapy. And I know both Lori and Robin, the compliance is tremendous and we really have to stick with it to see those benefits and work really hard with it. And um, they've both stuck with it and they have a comprehensive at-home wellness program. Um, Robin's up to walking, I think three and a half, three and a quarter miles daily. Um, we use the pool for her quite a bit. I don't have access to a pool, but I kind of coached her through a aquatics program post-operatively which was really, really helpful for her. Um, and then really just focusing for her now more on scapular shoulder blade strengthening and postural stuff um, up above. Thanks, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Lori. Yes. Um, okay. Hey, I'm Lori and uh, I'm 55 years old. And uh, I always... Um, I guess I always had a scoliosis. I didn't really realize I had it until I was in my 20s. And I was at a doctor's appointment for something else. And I remember looking over, he mentioned scoliosis and I saw the curve and I was like, oh yeah, that doesn't look right. But you know, whatever, <laughs> I didn't care. Um, I didn't have any pain. I was, I was extraordinarily active growing up uh, in sports and everything. Never really had a problem with it until um, as I got older into my late 20s, I started having back like tightness, um, general pain, nothing horrific um, until about four years ago. And, and it started, so I was right around 50, 51, I guess. And um, it really started hurting and then it progressively got worse uh, very quickly. And um, you know, I saw several doctors, um, I did shots, I did ablations, I did, um, uh, you name it, I did it. Um, nothing was helping me. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so finally, I started looking at um, doing research and I, and I saw several doctors in the country, everyone was saying the same thing. Everyone was pointing towards surgery. I did not want to do it. I'm a big, big baby. Um, did not want to do it. So I ended up in Dr. Rotes's office at Emory, who's a, a kind of an acquaintance of mine. And, and I was, I remember I was sitting in his office in tears and I said, Rusty, you got to do something for me. I can't do this surgery. I cannot. And he is the, it's the best thing anyone said to me. He, he said, you have got to get your head around this. Um, you are going to do it. You have to do it. And you're basically going to give up a year of your life to get the rest of your life back. And you're still young enough, you know, this is, you know, you've got the rest of your life to live. And, you know, it, this is a good, you know, this is a good thing. And, and he pointed me in Dr. A's direction. And um, by the time I saw her, I was, um, I could not stand on my feet for more than five minutes. I was in such pain. I had to sit down or I had to bend over to try to stretch my, it was my lower back that really caused the most pain for me. And um, I, I, you know, we had to, we went on a trip right before I had the surgery and I had to be in a wheelchair in the airport. I, I couldn't walk. So I thought my life was over. I really did. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I slept in a chair for a year, a year and a half. I couldn't sleep in a bed, couldn't lie flat. Um, not sleeping is considered a, is a torture, a method of torture. And I get it. I would have told anything at that point. I mean, I was working on, I, I, I was walking around on nothing. I, I, it, was, it was the lowest point my, I've ever been in my life. Um, so, had the surgery, um, I guess it was eight hours, hours, I don't really remember. Um, and, you know, I think I'm helium to T8, maybe T10, I got them mixed up. Um, and I was in, in the hospital for eight days. The, I was the freakish patient. You hear about all these people losing all this weight from the surgery. Yeah, I gained about 40. Um, I was so inflamed. I looked like if you touched me with a pen, I would explode. And, and of course, I mean, they, were, they thought I had clots. I mean, she, there were all kinds of weird things going on with me. And um, I, I had a very difficult recovery. I'm not going to lie. It was tough. It was painful. 
it was long. It was, um, it's, it's more pain than I've ever experienced in my life. And, and I, I looked like the Michelin man, the Michelin tire man. You know, I was so, I mean, literally, if you had touched me, I, I should have exploded. Um, no one really figured out why that happened, but I ended up at six months, I ended up uh, doing PT with Maggie. And that's when my life started changing. I started getting so much better bit by bit. Those little bitty exercises that you thought were so ridiculous changed my life. And all of a sudden, you know, it was a year after the surgery, I started looking more like a normal human being and uh, my life got so much better. And, and all I can say is I'm out walking five miles a day now, all the weight's gone, um, all that's disappeared. I'm back to normal. I have a life and it's just like Rusty said, I, I gave up a year to get the rest of my life. And I will tell you every single day of my life, I think about Maggie and I think about Dr. A and, and I got my life back and I, I can never, and I know she doesn't want this to be a Dr. A party, but when someone gives you your life back, uh, it's hard not to think about them all the time and be grateful. So that's it. Thanks, right. Dr. A. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Lori, again, kind of like, kind of like Robin, you know, the magnitude of her curve was not horrible. This is about a 45 degree curve, but again, the degenerative changes here, there's a lot of rotation right in this area. Um, was and it was pretty impressive and it looks like i i think maybe dr rhodes might have sent you for a discogram because the cat scan you had before oh. where they were trying to find one level that was the problem yeah he, he sure was, did do that and yeah uh, was, i'll I'm, never ever forgive him for that yeah <laughs> i'm sure that was agony to have yeah. every one of your discs shot up with fluid to try to find yeah. one and yeah. not surprisingly it wasn't just one disc yeah um so uh, yeah, I mean, I, re I remember when I saw you that I, I could tell you were miserable. I, I was worried because you were, I think, over 200 pounds when I met you, or close to 200 yep. pounds. Yep. Um, and 138 now, by the way. Yeah, I know. It's, it's <laughs> remarkable. Um, and the, the, the thing that was, I, I really learned from you um, was that, you know, I can't, uh, explain everything because you did blow up. You looked like that Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from the Ghost. Thank Buster. you. Yeah. And then I, I remember <laughs> Maggie. I remember Maggie calling me and telling me that she was happy to send you out the back door because she couldn't let you see any of my other, like my pre-op patients, so, <laughs> because they would be my practice was going to die on the vine. So she had a separate <laughs> entrance for you to go in and out for the, for the first first. Uh, <laughs> first uh -huh. part of this so um <laughs> anyway it's all turned out good now one year later it was like miraculous and you did have a t10 to the pelvis fusion you have almost no scoliosis when we say the, the curvature measures under 10 degrees i think i measured you at maybe 12 um and yeah and somehow all your weight dropped off i don't want this to be a magic weight loss thing but i i, I wish i could explain these things i knew you were miserable when you went to the mayo clinic in rochester in january um desperate desperate for help desperate um, so, yep. yeah um for sure maggie wants to from fitcore wants to jump in here uh yeah i would say with Lori, the biggest thing is if i were to like with in one sentence i feel like she felt trapped in her body even six months after surgery she felt like she she had no mobility I know we're joking around Stig Puff Marshmallow Man, but she just couldn't move. Yeah. She um, could barely walk. I mean, she was just miserably trapped. So for her, we did a ton of mobility work, stretching, manual work, trying to get some length and some mobility in the muscle tissue, encouraging slow graduated movement. I mean, she was ha having trouble with just basic activities of daily living, toileting, dressing, um, getting up and down a flight of stairs. And it wasn't that she couldn't do it, but her body was just fighting her. Um, and so that was the, 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 our biggest goal initially after surgery was just to get her moving and feeling like she could have some, some more mobility in things. Awesome. Well, right. it worked. Facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> 
So at this point, I want to say thank you to all of you for sharing your story. We're not done yet. We want to have a chance to offer some advice and encouragement. Before we do that, Dr. A, is there anything you would like to add? Um, I don't think so. I think maybe I'll just uh, summarize stuff at the when we're when we're wrapping. When we're at wrapping. the end. Okay. Yeah, so, some Connie, other- if you were going to offer some suggestions to people either considering the surgery or to think about in recovery or encouragement you'd like to offer, what would you like to say? I would say give up your pride. That's the first thing you have to do is give up pride because you're going to need assistance with a lot of things you weren't planning on having assistance with. Use a cane, use a walker. Don't be thinking you're too young for it because you don't want to fall. the core. I had worked so many years on my core and exercises that I just pretty much got out of bed um, in ICU without any problems. I mean, with help, but I didn't have um, issues with walking. So get that core strong and keep strong afterwards. Having great um, PT type people to work with you um, really helps. Thanks, Connie. Ken, how about you? Cool. Hold on, you're, you're muted, Ken. No, no. Uh, probably one of the, the biggest things was the two patients I got their names pre-op and called their modes, and that was extremely, extremely helpful. And the second thing is you do need to prepare to be check out of mainstream life for at least six months um, and, and listen to what Dr. A and Jennifer tell you to do, um, you know, follow the rules. Don't try to do things you're not supposed to do. I know the big thing with me was I want to get off the pain meds. And Jennifer said, we don't want you to go cold turkey. We want you to gradually get off the meds. So, you know, listen to what they tell you and, and do the exercises that you're told to do and uh, try to be the best place you can because in the end, it benefits you. Super advice. Um, Steve, how about you? Well, I forgot to mention all the injections, ablations, like Laura did, that they had done on me over the years. I mean, uh, I believe every joint in my back has had an injection, and sometimes it was uh, two or three injections, but at the same time, uh, none of that helped. Uh, and having core strength and keeping your body strength up, particularly your arms and legs, prior to surgery was the biggest is probably the biggest recommendation I can I can give to anybody. And like Ken said, six months to a year, at least the first six months, you're completely out of circulation. I mean, you know, go to the store or something and walk around the grocery store or whatever was good but after months, but uh for the first three months, you're just completely limited to being at home, and uh, that was kind of that was kind of hard to get used to. And uh, but getting your core strength up, and again, leg strength uh, has a lot to do with it to me. So, uh, the encouraging words I give anybody. Robin. Um. So um, my to be not to look online for answers. And um, in terms of before the surgery, what it's going to be like, lot, there are like a lot of horror stories on there. You know, like Dr. A can give you names of, of patients that have gone through it. And even after the surgery, you know, when there are times when I'm so low or like was I progressing the way I should be, you know, looking online, if you're not going to get what you need. So there are plenty of us who have been through this and I'm always really happy to talk to folks. Um, I'm also noticing on here a question about childbirth and I had no trouble giving child, having giving birth to children with scoliosis. Um, others may have a to respond to that. It, it, it was not an issue for me. Okay, that's it. Lori? Um, I, I would echo, if you're able to get in touch with, a, with someone who's had the surgery ahead of time, do it. Um, I think that is, I would have loved to have had that option, and I, and I didn't. 
Um, I will also speak to this, and, and this may be just me, but um, I was not prepared for the depression that I that really set in on me after uh, during the recovery. Um, I did have the weird in inflammation and the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man or whatever I was, but you know that was part of it. But but just um, being alone and being in pain and not being able to do anything, it's it's um. I really struggled with that. It, it can be very, very depressing and um, challenging. So don't, you know, be aware of that. Just do be aware of that and know that that's normal. Um, but if there is someone that you can get a phone number for and have it, you know, do it. Because it would have been wonderful to have had someone who had gone through this to tell me it's gonna be okay. You know, you're gonna be okay and someone who has actually gone through this because if you haven't had this type of surgery before it's a big deal <laughs> you know it's tough and um i did not expect that i did not see that coming so that was a little hard for me well and Lori, i'll add to that when we uh when several of us got together for lunch for the first time and we were at different stages in the recovery uh we had someone with us who was a lot earlier mm -hmm. surgery and it, or recovery process and it was such a remembering for all of us remember we were yep. like oh i forgot how bad it was back and it made her life. feel so much better if right. i remember correctly because she saw us walking around and you know it's um yeah it's it's a uh, it's tough it's a tough recovery but and I, and I will say one more thing i do remember thinking i'm going to do every single thing they tell me to do maggie and dr a told me to do because if this for some reason doesn't work, it's not going to be because of me. <laughs> I am going to be the model patient. And, and I did, I did everything I was told to do, so. I would say the same thing on that because I told Dr. A, I'm not coming back because I did something I wasn't, I wasn't right. supposed to. Me to too. Do. So we're gonna follow instructions. And I would say that to people in terms of the support you need when uh, get rails on your bed or a hospital bed or a, a raised seat in your bathroom or using your walker. Um, all those things that we always would have railed against because by God, we were going to muscle through this. Uh, you need to say to yourself, like Connie said, you don't want to fall. So, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, it'll go a lot better. And And I would add again what several of you said is when people tell you it's a six month recovery that first stage of recovery it is a six month recovery of course i thought that meant two months but it doesn't it's a six month recovery and and then the second six months are still part of the recovery but it's a much more nuanced thing i remember thinking at the end of six months um, this is great and this is as good as it's going to be and i'm good and I could not believe the amount of increased improvement I had the second six months, all in a more nuanced stage, but still very, very real. I, I had significant improvement even after the first year. I know, I know everyone says, you know, a year. I, I just finished my second year of, you know, since the surgery and my life today is so much better than it was even at one year. So I don't know how to explain that, but that's, that's my experience. Somebody asked about how long does the pain last? And one really piece of, great piece of advice um, that I think Dr. A, your office gave me was, you look at it week to week, right? Like any, any particular day, the off day, and you're just not, you're in bad shape. But if you look from week to week, you see a gradual improvement on the pain level. Um, where obviously it's the worst at the beginning. I think at three months, it's significantly better. At six months, it's much better. And then after that, I agree, it's nuanced. But it's, we said how bad, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Um, but week by week, it gets better and you get through it. I mean, you just do. Yeah, I think it's just really important to know that part, Robin, that you're gonna get through it and it's not, you know, it's not what it's always going to be like i noticed on here somebody else asked about sleeping on their back or their side or whatever i had been sleeping on my stomach at the time before the surgery and dr a said to me well it's because you're trying to get a little lift <laughs> to be able to breathe 
but uh, but I sleep both on my side and on my back now. Now, um, I I didn't sleep on my back in the early, uh, you know, early probably three months or whatever, right? Because the you're getting used to the rod and you're got scar tissue and all that kind of stuff, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't have those kind of issues. The other thing I want to say about pain, by the way, is for folks who are thinking about this, before the surgery, you have pain, but you know it's not getting any better. After the surgery, you've got all this pain, but you think, okay, but it's improving. And so there's a way in which that pain is handled because there's an end in sight. Mm -hmm. Other, um, Steve, I didn't ask you advice that you would have. Say that again, Nancy. Any recommendations or advice that you would give people, encouragement that you would give them? Oh, yeah, you asked me that. But uh, someone had a question about bariatric surgery. Uh, if you haven't had it, uh, I don't think you ought to get, try some of the other uh, programs out there that are non-surgical. Uh, again, it it's created some... I mean, I'm on a I'm on vitamin supplements uh, every day, and will be the rest of my life just to keep my blood work uh, in some semblance of of normal. But uh, I went from all my blood work being above the line to everything, a lot of the key factors being below the line now. So uh, I wouldn't recommend to anyone that's that's got a back problem. I lost the weight hoping that the back problem would get better, but instead the back problem continued to get worse. I was able to do a lot more than what I had been doing prior to the surgery just because of my weight. But uh, after the surgery, I was able to do more and consequently I was using my back more and I think that probably made the uh, uh, back pain even that much worse. Uh, and I was on so much pain medication, the narcotics. I did not realize how bad I was. And, uh, you know, I was able to function on a daily basis, but other people saw it in me, but I wasn't able to see it because I was just, I was living with it. But uh, after having the surgery and being off the pain meds about two or three months after coming off of all the pain medication I was on, uh, I was so much better. I mean, I was seeing things clearly where before I, I wasn't completely processing everything. So, Yours is just a beautiful story, Steve. Uh, Sarah, Maggie, anything you would like to add in terms of advice or encouragement? Sarah, I'll ask you to go first and then Maggie. So the one thing that always kind of stuck home, and I see someone even, um, Miriam, asks about um, kind of the spouse and what the roles. And so that was one of the biggest things that a lot of my patients have told me um, is that especially if they're used to being the homemaker and the one that kind of keeps the house going and rolling, that they have to step back from that role for a long time. And so it's hard for them to, that, that you just have to kind of manage that and set the right expectations. And that's why I think it's great that Dr. A involves the spouse in some of the visits and make sure that everyone's kind of knows that that's going to be the role going forward. Um, and then it was to hear Robin talk about how literally each week it gets better. And we're lucky as PTs is you see you before surgery, but then I don't see you again for six months to a year. And so I see that big change. And so we don't really see so much the in between, but it's just kind of keeping your spirits up and knowing that each week it's going to get better and better and better. Maggie? Yeah, I think, Nancy, you may have mentioned it, but um, one thing I hear from my patients and what I coach my patients on is having that team around them. So it can be family and friends, a team of clinicians and clinicians that you can kind of trust the process with. And you no longer have to do all the work and carry the burden yourself and know that these people are going to do that for you and to guide you down that path. Sc scoliosis management, whether it's surgery or not, I think requires a team and it 
can be anyone from nutritionists. We've heard some of the nutrition aspects of, of this. Um, it can be your, your physical therapist, your massage therapist, your physicians, your spouse, but having that team around you, I think can be really helpful. Um, and then the other thing um, I would say is that um, I think Robin was speaking to it is just knowing that it will get better and, and trusting the process and um, just putting your faith in people and knowing that I've, I've done this, I've done what I can do to get myself here. And then now they're going to take it the rest of the way for me, as long as I contribute as best that I can. Um, I would put a plug in for um, prehab for those of you who are considering surgery. Please encourage your physician to recommend some prehab or some pre-therapy uh, prior to your surgery. I think it does make a world of difference. The patients I see who have done therapy prior to their surgery are remarkably better and have vastly different outcomes, better outcomes than the patients who did not go to therapy prior to. Um, so if you haven't, please encourage your um, physician to recommend that for you. That's great advice, Maggie. I will say the, the one other thing, and then Dr. A, I'll turn it over to you, is um, you're going to, I had expectations um, of how the whole thing was going to go. And of course, a lot of the recovery was different than I thought. I mean, in some ways, parts of it were easier than I thought, and in some ways were hard. And what I realized was my whole brain was like being rewired. You know, my, I, I was learning how to like stand in space and how to sit down and how to move and how your legs worked. And I remember swinging out of a car and like freezing in motion, like my foot didn't exactly know where it was supposed to go. And, and it's just your, your body's all this work to keep you upright. And now, now you're in space. It takes a little while for all that to uh, come back to normal kind of thing. And I think it's, it's exhausting. And so that's why you sleep all the time. So Dr. A, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so we have a lot of, I think we've answered most of the questions. I can specifically answer some more. Um, Lauren Rosen asked about constipation, constant coughing. Those are things that we see um, we see um, a quite a bit of improvement in um, afterwards. Again, it depends on the individual patient. Um, a lot also depends on where you started out. I think every patient's journey, I think that you guys can see, everyone should be able to see every patient's journey is, is very different. Um, I think the team approach is really important. We had a couple of our um, techs on, one of the techs that helps me during all these cases who never gets to see the actual patient, never gets to meet you guys. So he was excited. Um, I can't do this by myself. We have a few reps on um, who are also helping out. Um, and we're, we, we want to be part of the team. We, I have a team behind me. I'm like thankful to all my partners who we discuss all of your cases. Um, I, think it's, I think to Maggie's point about having a team, about really, really prepping whoever you're surgeon is to you know, get you moving forward. I would encourage people to see people early. I know Christine Norwood's on here and she wishes she could walk much further than she could. By the time, by the time a lot of you've gotten to me, you're so debilitated that it's very, very difficult to, to kind of, you can't unring a bell. So um, especially the people with stenosis and you're noticing weakness and leg pain, um, I don't know, none of you guys really spoke to this, but um, a lot of times I do have people afterwards say, I wish I had done this earlier. I wish I had done it earlier. Um, I, I don't really believe in hindsight and regrets. In surgery, you can't have regrets because you got to keep moving forward. Otherwise, you'll mope about something that just happened. But I do think that um, trying to seek out help early um, is really important. Um, and to that end, let me just kind of share the, uh, we're going to send out an email with uh, people's contact information for more questions. Um, and um, if you want to schedule an appointment with a spine doctor, we'll send those numbers. Um, Sarah is here at Emory. Uh, Maggie is at uh, FitCore. Um, I have a really good network of therapists. We all really um, are very avidly discussing cases. Um, Tanisha Criddle is my admin who's been amazing at helping me schedule all this stuff. If you have any other questions, you can reach out to her and I'll send you guys some emails. But I think we're, uh, I think we're probably... Uh, Good to go. I'll try to answer other people's questions when I like pull the chat afterwards. So. 
So Dr. A, as, as we wrap up, I do know that on behalf of all of us who are uh, patients of yours, we too want to thank the team that stands behind you, both in terms of visits into the office and also all those people that are part of the surgery team. So many of them come in to say hello before surgery starts. Uh, and they do amazing work. And as much as we all strongly know what a miracle worker you are, we also know that you couldn't be that without all these other folks. And so it's our honor and privilege to have had this time to spend with people tonight. I know we all have more of these so that more people can be aware of the fact that this is an option. Um, and we look forward to seeing folks in the future. So thanks for having us, Dr. A. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.